if the presidency, in Eisenhower's words, is the most powerful position in the free world, it is also the most awesome. The president has the power of life and death, of peace or war. Indeed, in this nuclear age, the power of possible annihilation of all life on Earth. The president must live with that knowledge as he wrestles with the countless other matters which call for his decision. As Harry Truman said of his office, the buck stops here. Presidents Kennedy and Eisenhower have stated it in different terms. It's much easier to make the speeches than it is to finally make the judgments. Because, uh, unfortunately, your advisors are frequently divided. If you take the wrong course, and on occasion I have, uh, the president bears the burden and responsibility quite rightly. The advisors may move on to new advice. The president is responsible. I don't care. Uh, the president can be sitting in the White House. He can take his advice from his youngest child. He can, he can go to anywhere in the United States and get advice. But no, nothing in this earth can take away from him the fixed responsibility he must make a decision. Well, you know, that old story about the Abraham Lincoln in the cabinet. He says, all in favor say aye, and the whole cabinet uh, voted aye, and, uh, and all opposed no, and Lincoln voted no, and he said the vote is no. So that uh, naturally the Constitution places the responsibility on the uh, president. The other point is something that President Eisenhower said to me. He said, there are no easy matters will ever come to you as president. If they're easy, they will be settled at a lower level. So the matters that finally come to you as president are always the difficult matters, the matters which carry with them large implications. The difficult matters can come upon the president at any time, any place. Lyndon Johnson, after leaving office, recalled some of the horrors of hell that invaded his nights in the White House. I uh, said to someone uh, the other day that one of the things I enjoyed most was being able to go to bed at after the 10 o'clock news at night and to sleep until daylight the next morning. Uh, I don't remember ever having an experience like that in the five years I was in the White House. The real horror was to be seeking soundly about 3.30 or 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning and have the telephone ring and the operator say, sorry to wake you, Mr. President. There's just a second between the time the operator got me on the line until she could get Mr. Rosto in the Situation Room or Mr. Bundy in the Situation Room. And uh, we went through the horrors of hell. Had we hit a rushing ship? Uh, had an accident occurred? We have another Pueblo? Uh, uh, someone made a mistake. Were we at war? Well, those experiences are gone. Uh, you say, don't you miss them? Sure you miss them. I, I really never did want those calls to begin with. I would have liked to have missed them when I was there. This is Truman's view of the presidential decision-making process. All my life, whenever it comes time to make a decision, I make it and forget about it and go to work on something else. And when these things came before me as president of the United States, I made the decision on them and went into the next thing. You never have time to stop. You've got to keep going because there's always a decision just ahead of you that you've got to make. And you don't want to look back. If you make a mistake in one of those decisions, correct you by another decision and go ahead. Truman had a number of major decisions to make. The use of the newly developed atom bomb in the closing days of World War II, the development of the hydrogen bomb, the emerging Cold War with the Soviet Union, the hot war in Korea. In a 1958 interview, Truman was asked which had been his toughest decision. The most difficult decision I had to make while I was in office was Korea. Any regrets? Not the slightest. Not the slightest in the world. Uh, the reason that I was able to make the Korean decision, I remembered Munich and the League of Nations. And we had just established the United Nations. The United Nations passed a resolution which had recognized the Republic of Korea and had, it had been established. And when the Republic of Korea was about to be overcome by aggression started by the communists, backed by Russia and, and what later became communist China, it seemed to me that the proper thing was to establish the United Nations as a going concern, and that's what I tried to do. And that, but that was the most difficult decision I had to make during my whole administration of eight years. One of the major decisions of Kennedy's administration was to confront the Soviet Union over the presence of Russian rockets in Cuba, the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
The president announced a series of actions, including a blockade against Soviet ships headed for Cuba. The world seemingly teetered on the brink of war and then regained its balance. Here, a recollection of how that decision came to be made. The uh, most recent one was hammered out really our policy and decision over a period of uh, five or six days. During that period, the 15 people, more or less, who were directly consulted frequently uh, changed their view uh, because uh, whatever action we took had so many uh, disadvantages to it. And each action that we took raised the prospect that the, it might escalate with the Soviet Union into a nuclear war. Finally, however, I think a general consensus developed uh, and certainly seemed after all alternatives were examined that the course of action that we finally adopted was the right one. Now, uh, when I talked to members of the Congress, several of them suggested a different alternative when we confronted them on that Monday with the evidence. My feeling is that if they had gone through the five-day period we had gone through at looking at the various alternatives, the advantages and disadvantages of action, they probably would have come out the same way that we did. I think we took the right one. The president is at once the leader of the government and the leader of his political party. Frequently, the two functions overlap. Occasionally, they conflict. One area of sharpest conflict centers on the president's powers of appointment, particularly judicial appointments, with the advice and consent of the Senate. Some observations by President Nixon. During a four-year term, the President of the United States, sitting at this desk in this historic room, makes over 3,000 major appointments to various government positions. By far, the most important appointments he makes are those to the Supreme Court of the United States. Presidents come and go, but the Supreme Court, through its decision, goes on forever. These are the criteria I believe should be applied in naming people to the Supreme Court. First, the Supreme Court is the highest judicial body in this country. Its members, therefore, should, above all, be among the very best lawyers in the nation. The second consideration is the judicial philosophy of those who are to serve in the court. Now, I emphasize the word judicial because whether an individual is a Democrat or Republican cannot and should not be a decisive factor in determining whether he should be on the court. By judicial philosophy, I do not mean agreeing with the president on every issue. It would be a total repudiation of our constitutional system if judges on the Supreme Court or any other federal court, for that matter, were like puppets on a string pulled by the president who appointed them. When I appointed Chief Justice Berger, I told him that from the day he was confirmed by the Senate, he could expect that I would never talk to him about a case that was before the court. In the case of both Chief Justice Berger and Mr. Justice Blackman, and in the case of the two nominees that I shall be sending to the Senate tomorrow, their sole obligation is to the Constitution and to the American people, and not to the President who appointed them to their positions. The relationship between the three branches of the federal government, the Presidency, the Congress, and the courts, has been marked by periodic dissensions, by fears founded or unfounded, that one branch is trying to encroach upon the authority of another. It is out of these clashes that their powers have evolved and continue to evolve. A president confronted by an opposition Congress can often be stymied in the enactment of his legislative programs. President Roosevelt, in his first administration, however, had a Congress apparently eager to do his bidding. As a result, numerous programs were passed, and Congress got a thank you from the president. In the many methods of attack with which we met those problems, you and I, by mutual understanding, and by determination to cooperate, help to make democracy succeed.